Hello, Internet. Welcome to episode number 181 of the Comic Watchers show. Thank you for letting us come back. Uh, my name is Matt. I'm your host, along with the one and only Chadley Burdett. And uh, with us this week, we have Matthew Klein. He is the sales manager for the U.S. comics market at Penguin Random House, the co-founder of Rain or Shine Productions, and writer of the recently <laughs> wrapped crashing mini series at idw matthew that was a mouthful uh you wear a lot of hats my friend how the heck are you well considering i'm going bald i have to start wearing more hats so that's nice <laughs> i understand I'm i got a little bit of thinning starting i in, get it in the back there in the back i got that little crown going and it's not because i'm a king that's for sure so, but no, I am here and thrilled to be on Comic Watchers. I love that intro, and I, I'm you know 181 episode 181. That's incredible. 181. Congratulations! Thank you, thank you very much. Like Correct this whole, I don't want to get like way out in the weeds, but considering that this show started with four writers for the site just bullshitting for two and a half hours and not knowing what sure. the heck they were doing, um, yeah, I. Kind of, I kind of tip my hat to us a little bit. Like we're still it's around. fantastic. <laughs> so it's fantastic. Now, um, one eighty one isn't Daredevil one eighty one where Electra gets killed. You nailed it. You're so right. you know what? I will. Yeah, I will. I'm getting it. killed. <laughs> <laughs> but also resurrected. So it's okay. but also resurrected later. No, that's right. it's one of my that's favorite right. Daredevil issues. So I, I I'm thrilled to be on. <laughs> I, I think I've got an 8.5 CGC in the other room. So there you go. That's amazing. That's a hell of a I just want to say hi, hi, hi to Matt again. I, we talked at the New York uh, Comic Con, and it's probably going to be a lot less quieter, a lot less going on, hopefully better internet. <laughs> Although the, the, that like fresca setting that they had at the idea That was nice. was really impressive. It was really cool. <laughs> Matt, you should have seen this thing. It was it was like sitting outside in like Italy at this in this setup. It was really all out. I, I give them I give the, the crew awesome. there all the all the uh, the pats on the back. It was the I, nicest I, I, I uh, interview you, area. <laughs> nice. I'm really hoping um, next year I'll get to make it out to some of the bigger cons. So uh yeah fingers crossed in that regard but anyway um uh, man crashing let's talk about it it just wrapped at sure. idw um mm -hmm. gotta say there's a lot of stuff to unpack with this story <laughs> but if um I i'm the hires up at idw what's your ele elevator pitch for this series uh the elevator pitch for crashing was um if I remember exactly from the the pitch that we came up with, it was something like the uh, the medical drama of of House mixed with the great gritty uh, real world superhero aspects of Netflix's Daredevil. I think that was sort of the original pitch, um, and that's really how I talk. I think about it. You know, it's it's House meets uh, meets the meets daredevil that's that's really what what i like to think of it is you know it's it's got the medical drama aspect uh it's got the superhero uh flavor to it but at the end of the day it's really a character study and a character drama which i really love about crashing and, and i appreciate for it well and and i i'll get more into the the set decor so to speak as, as sure. we move on but Really, I kind of feel, having read it, and I, I certainly don't want to spoil the ending for any or, or any major plot points for anyone that has not read it yet. But um, you know, for the, the the medical side of it and the uh, superhero side of it, that's kind of not superfluous, but it's outside of the, the the main plot, which is about the main character Rose Osler's struggle with addiction and sobriety. Absolutely. Uh, there is some really, really powerful stuff that is said and written uh, and drawn by Morgan Beam, who's just fantastic um, throughout I will, the story. I will ditto what, that. Yeah. Please, go ahead. Uh, talk, no, talk yeah, to no. us about where this came from, because I'll be honest with you, sure. you could have just done medical drama set in a superhero world and been fine. It would have been great. <laughs> Very <laughs> Astro City. 
So here's what's fascinating, Max. Thank you for bringing up Astro City because I think if there is if there is a really good comp, comics wise, I almost say it's Astro City. Um, and and if we were if we get to do more of crashing, I think you could I could make an argument that I would keep the city setting. I don't necessarily have to keep following Rose. I think there's enough in that city in that world that we built that we just tell stories forever. But for me, uh, this actually came about at the height of the pandemic watching testimonials from nurses and doctors who were just overrun with COVID wards. Their entire hospitals became COVID wards. And they would talk about the stress and the abuse they were taking and the never ending struggle day in where they had no idea if they could save their patients. Because this is before vaccines, before antivirals, before anything. And they would be, and they talked about having panic attacks in their cars outside of the hospital and then they have to go in for a 12 hour shift, um, separating families, doing this incredible above and beyond um, actions taken by these everyday heroes. And so I, I really wanted to tell a story that's sort of honored an everyday hero, like a first responder, like Rose is. Um, but I, I wanted to show that these everyday heroes are people. Um, we tend to, as a society, put doctors on a pedestal where they're supposed to know more than us because we, we put our lives in their hand. We put our, their health, our health in their hands. You know, I did yesterday. I had a doctor give me general anesthesia, put me under. I was confident he was going to be able to wake me up. And that's a certain power over my, myself that I gave a doctor. And we do that every time we go in. Right. So that's sort of social contract. Yeah, absolutely. And so I wanted to, I wanted to showcase the idea that a doctor is a human being and is just as messed up and going through trauma as much as anybody else um, and to do justice to them. The addiction for me, the addiction aspect, uh, I thought just made perfect sense with this character who is addicted to control, who is addicted to trying to save lives. Um, in particular, she's addicted to saving lives of people in a way that she felt no one ever came to save her uh, when she was younger. Um, and, and I'm fine with spoilers, by the way, Matt. Like, I'm a, I'm a big believer. You should know every single thing that happens in a story, experience it, and still come away thinking, wow, that was amazing. And that's how you know the story is good. So feel free to spoil. Um, <laughs> okay. All right. You heard it here first. It's a spoiler. Absolutely. So, so for Rose, I, I thought that addiction was a really, you know, important aspect of that character because addiction is about control as well. Um, addiction is about feeling normal. Uh, addiction is something that I, I've had in some presence in my life since I was born. My mother is an addictions counselor for 40 years um, and board certified psychotherapist with it. And I've known a lot of people. I've met a lot of people. I've read a lot of books. I stay up to date on a lot of um, things happening in that field. And also in, in looking at the world right now and what we could set it in and what we could use to make crashing universal addiction is rampant we we had 108,000 overdose deaths in a 12 month period over 2020 and 2021 that's more than any time on record so the other thing about it too is is i wanted to tell a story that could be recognizable to people people recognize addiction people recognize uh, the power we give doctors in that social contract you very smartly um, uh, identified there. And people also recognize superheroes, you know, let's, let's be clear. It's, it's, it's a, it's something that's not going away in our cultural zeitgeist, nor will it ever, nor do I hope it ever does. So, so all those things sort of came together for Rose to create her. And then it was a matter of finding a world in which she is an everyday hero has power over people who are technically far more powerful than she is with superpowers, with abilities, as we like to call it. And I thought that was such a, a fascinating uh, dynamic and instantly gave you this dramatic tension um, of somebody who can literally shape, shoot laser beams out of his eye, uh, but he doesn't know how to heal a gunshot wound to himself. He has to rely on somebody with no powers to do that for him. And I thought that was really, really interesting and just filled with a lot of potential drama to it. And that's really where we started from. Chad, jump in, bud. Oh, so uh, this was your first 
uh, published work. I mean, but, but before that, you uh, am I right that you did web comic, correct? Yeah, I, I did. A, I've got a web comic up on Tapas. It's still there. Um, it's called No Rhyme or Reason. It's just a pulpy late '80s noir set in Philadelphia because I am a huge crime fan um, and detective story fan. We're actually working on the sequel now. Uh, should be ready to go in in April uh, for his next case. Um, and then before that uh, and during that, really, I wrote um, and produced some audio dramas for a podcast that I was working on called April is the Cruelest Month, where we did a series of alternate history tales um, set within major events that happened in the month of April. Um, and that all started during the pandemic because before that I was a playwright, primarily writing and producing theater. And I've been doing that for about a decade um, and been getting produced in Toronto and Florida, um, little festivals, um, and little pop-up shows all over New York. Um, and it built a really wonderful network of actors and directors and producers. Um, but pandemic happens and shuts down live performance. Um, so we had to figure out how to make content, what we were going to do. And so that's kind of going backwards. That's how it all happened. But then the whole time I'm working in the comics industry, I know so many people. Uh, I'm a writer by trade. I'm a writer by education. And uh, some friends of mine in the industry were just like, when are you going to try and write a comic? When's it happening? Like, what, why are you? I, I work with 600 comic shops every single day at Penguin Random House. I've known thousands of comic shop owners for 10 years now. Um, I'm the opposite of how most comic creators start out, wherein they don't they don't have the network of stores yet to to pitch their product to. And I have that network. I just didn't have the creative uh, backing yet. So it just felt like a natural fit. Like I'd been denying going down this path for so long and the stars finally aligned and, and here we are. So how is, you know, doing the, you know, the plays and stuff, how did was, how is that making the transition to, you know, comics and web comics and stuff like that? So what's fun, it made it fun. Cause like the, the thing about the thing about plays is I came from a place where I can write dialogue um, and I'm really good at character where I struggle with, where, where my learning curve is, is with plot um, and having something last over multiple episodes and telling that sort of episodic arc. That was the big challenge. And then of course there's formatting, you know, it's a visual medium. It's not an, an audio medium. So I would, I would try and do a pass of each script with no dialogue to begin and then add the dialogue in um, and, and go from there. And then my, my goal with every pass is how do I cut down the dialogue? How do I cut down? How do I cut down? How do I cut down? And so that really becomes my mission statement with comics. And that's why I did the, the web comic actually is kind of a, an exercise in that because the web comic is structured that it's 10 panels per chapter for 10 chapters. And so I don't have a lot of room. I can't have five characters talking at once. I can't have big monologues because I only have 10 panels to move the story forward. So that was how I sort of utilized the training ground to get out of monologuing, which is what I usually do to figure out what my characters are thinking. Um, and in this case, I have to do the total opposite. I need to, they have to show me what they're doing in action versus through their words. So that was a, I mean, a really big adjustment and I'm still figuring it out. I'm still learning. Um, you know, I'll never, I'll never have it perfect, but I'll keep trying. You know, as, as, and I don't, I don't know as much about the the craft of uh, playwriting as I, as I do writing comics, but to a degree, insofar as you can at least imagine actors performing what you're writing, there's yeah. going to be a degree of, of block of stage blocking. And awesome. at least in yeah. your head, um, and in what you vision, of course, the actors and the director are what really make it pop. But um, I would imagine anyway, and tell me if I'm wrong, but there's there's not there's similarities, at least between that and your first rough passes at, at a comic with no dialogue. Um, some. Yeah. I mean, and it certainly helps. Like I can I'm really good at hearing the words in my head. Um, and in terms of how I wanted to, to find out. So figuring out the intonation for the dialogue was great. Um, yeah, and I, I've trained as a theater director uh, a, a bit and I've done some directing. So yeah, the idea of, of blocking is there, but I, you know, the, the trick is live performance. It's, it's a totally different set of blocking. Sure. And also 
you don't have many sets to play with. That's one of the biggest yeah. things that I had to do um, with with crashing is I had to forget that I I had to remember I have a budget. Like I can I don't I don't have to work within a strict budget and only have like everything set in a kitchen for two hours. I can have like multiple set pieces and multiple scenes and the locations and and really play. And so there's a freedom to that, which was really, really cool. But I had to train myself to utilize it. Um, I remember at one point actually in issue five, because throughout crashing, there's an interior monologue that Rose is having. And in issue five, I really went away with it. I, I stopped using it. And my editor, Heather Antos, was like, you, you got you to gotta bring it back. I was like, but I thought the, uh, the goal was to have fewer words. And she was like, yes, but this is, this is now something you've, you've set as a standard in each issue. And we need it to tell the subtext a little bit so that we have some juxtaposition and to also help with transitions from one page or one scene to, to another. And I was like, oh, okay. So I had to add more words. And that was, that was a weird moment for me of like, I know how to do this. I can overwrite. Why am I not overwriting? Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting. It like yo-yoed a little bit back and forth between issues. I can see that. I mean, yeah. again, as, as someone that, that hasn't, that's familiar with comics, but hasn't been writing them for, you know, however long, however many years, uh, that could be a little bit of a learning curve. Like in, in terms of learning curve, how do you feel you adapted your writing style and quirks and ticks? from other media to comics? Uh, pretty well. I think what helped me tremendously is when I worked at Valiant uh, for, for several years as the, and I worked my way up to being vice president of sales and marketing over there. And one of the things I would do is I would read the scripts um, before, before the artwork would even come in. I would read all the pitches and I would read all the scripts. So I had you know, I was reading scripts by Jeff Lemire. I was reading scripts by Matt Kint, by Ray Fox, by Tim Seeley, you know, and, and I was getting to, I was getting to watch all these different types of scripts come in. Some that were extremely detailed and others that were far more. And on this page, there's a big fight, you know? So like I, I, I had an education in comic script writing, um, by being in that position, I got such exposure to different styles of script writing that when I started to, to do it here for comics, I, I had what felt like a pretty good base of what worked and what didn't work in terms of formatting and in terms of pacing. Because I would hear the editors talk. I would hear the editors talk about what worked about the script, what didn't work about the script. And one of those editors was my editor for Crashing, Heather Antos, because we, we met at Valiant. Um, and that's where we became, you know, co-workers. And then I like to think very good friends. Um, I, I would call her one of my best friends, but I don't pretend that I'm her best friend. She's going to yell at me if she ever hears this, but um, <laughs> in a good way, in a, in a, in a friend's way. But yeah, so, so I, I had great teachers. I had great teachers in those incredible writers and incredible editors um, so that the transition would be easier than if I was coming to it completely brand new. So again, it's like my my whole life for, for a decade now, I've been preparing to go down this path as a comic writer and just didn't even realize it. It's amazing. So what is your history with uh, comics? Do you, you know, when did you read your first comic? You know, what, you know, <sighs> made you think, you know, I eventually, you know, want to try my hand at, you know, doing this. <laughs> so my comic book origin story is a weird one. Um, it's, so I didn't read comics as a kid. Uh, my uncle got me Superman 75 and said, I, I bought a copy for you to read and I bought a copy for you to save to pay for your college education. Uh, it didn't work out. And, and, and it's weird because my uncle Michael, um, if he ever hears this, I want to give him his props. He's a very smart guy in his, in his semi-retirement, he day trades and does very, very well. So this was a real miss as far as investments go on his part. But no, I never read comics as a kid. Um, I never went into comic book shops a lot. I did go to a couple in my hometown of Philly, uh, Fat Jack, shout out to them on a, on a Sansom Street. Uh, but what ended up happening is just like, I was so shy. I was a painfully shy kid. So the idea of actually going into a comic book shop was intimidating to me. And I just never went. Um, I threw myself into professional wrestling. I'm a huge mark. Uh, for pro wrestling. And then um, I also 
got into comics and the characters through the animated series of the mid nineties and the early nineties. So Batman, the animated series, Spider-Man, Fantastic Four, Iron Man, which is one of the worst intros of all time. Um, but that was really, that was really my exposure to the characters. And then in college, there was an extremely cute girl down the dorm of my freshman year of college. And her name was Samantha Sharon. And she was reading 52, the weekly series. And so to try and figure something to talk to her about, I started reading comic books. And really, I started reading graphic novels. And I bought them at Forbidden Planet because uh, it was near my dorm, which is hilarious because coming out of grad school in 2011, my first job out of grad school was to work at Forbidden Planet. And that's how I got my start. I was working on the sales floor, just hand selling comics. Um, from 2011 to 2014, all while working at an off-Broadway theater company full-time and starting my own theater company and producing shows in New York um, and the surrounding areas. Then 2014, uh, Valiant Entertainment was hiring a salesperson, and it was their first major salesperson hire there. They were a smaller team. They were expanding. And uh, they came to try and hire a friend of mine that was working at Forbidden Planet with me. And he said, no, not me, but there's another guy named Matt that I work with that you should absolutely talk to. And uh, I thank him every time I see him, but that was Matthew Rosenberg. So to understand at Forbidden Planet, I'm working, slinging comics every day and we're, we're working the new, new release wall every Tuesday night with Matthew Rosenberg, Vida Ayala, Tyler Boss, and Danny Lohr. Those were my, my comrades. We, we were in the trenches together. Uh, they really need to do an alumni section, does Forbidden Planet. Um, <laughs> we're all there at the exact same time. We're there for years working together, for I think at least two years. So, so Matthew Rosenberg recommends me to Valiant because he decides he wants to continue being a full-time comic book writer and pursue that dream. And boy, did he make the right call. So I lie to Valiant basically in the first interview and pretend I know anything about their characters because I don't think I'm getting this job. What do I know about comics publishing? I just talk comic books. I sell stuff to people. That's it. But they like me enough. They bring me back for another interview. And that's when I read everything from their relaunch in 2012. Um, so two years worth of Valiant Comics in about a week. Get in there. I get the job. I work as a salesperson. Um, and then over the, the years, I'm, I'm going to 250 shops in the U.S. I'm going to the U.K. I'm going to shops in Canada. We're going to, I think in 2015, we exhibited 41 weekends out of the year. So I, I was on the road for 20 of them. So every convention you can think of, basically, we went to. Um, and then in 2018, there was a, a kind of a leadership overhaul there. And I got bumped up to being uh, vice president of sales. Six months later, I also took over the marketing department and I had a crew of seven. And then under, um, uh, let's see, it's uh, through 2021, uh, I'm starting to feel a little stale at Valiant. I start looking around. Penguin Random House has a job uh, open. And so I decide to throw my hat in the ring. I have no expectation I'm going to get it. Uh, but they hire me to be a, a sales manager on the team. And I think I'm going to sell backlist, you know, DC titles and Pantheon and Knopf and, and Mouse, basically, to comic shops. And I'm going to go work for a giant corporation. That'll be cool. And then three days after they offer me the job, they make the announcement that Marvel is coming over exclusively comics, basically doing a shock to the entire system. And so now I work with 600 accounts, 600 comic shops on the West Coast, Arizona, Texas, and some key accounts in, in the Northeast. Um, I also work with the entertainment accounts. So Broadway theaters, I still get my theater background, um, but everybody who merchandise for Broadway theaters, Pixar, um, tons of places that I get to have some fun. BBC just emailed me an order. So like I, I get to have a blast. And so that's that's my history from a guy trying to impress a girl down the hall of his dorm to slinging books with future heavyweight writers in the industry to working for a top 10 publisher in sales to working for the biggest book distributor in the world. And now one of the biggest, if not the biggest comics distributor um, and also now as a, a writer.
in, in the industry. So I've done everything except work for a printer and I'll never do that. <laughs> so there so, you go. So that's my, that's my long... you have a very strong resume. <laughs> I've, I've got a, <laughs> I've got a wild journey in comics that if you told me at that 10 is years old, nuts. that is crazy. Oh. And I mean, it's in, in a weird, it's a small world kind of way. Our former peer um, Cody White is now editor over at Valiant. Yeah. So, like, uh, crazy. Um, yeah. What was it like? And you you came on in 2014 at Valiant. And that was just huh? around a couple years after their great big relaunch. Sure. Um, what the hell was it like over there? Because I can only imagine it was it was just like this surge of energy and kind of a wild west yeehaw anything can go because like you said you had some powerhouse writers you were working with at the time joshua dysart kent lemire fox uh my goodness man <laughs> no it was it was exactly that it was it was the wild west and you know and it was it was a really fun time there in a lot of ways because we had no limits at that point you know we were just like it doesn't matter what anything costs just get your word out, get your name out there. We were, we were fighting for space on the shelf. We were fighting for name recognition and brand recognition. And our job was get the books hot, get these characters hot, get their, get attention. You can get sales and, or you can get press. Both are measurements of success. So what can you do? So what was really fun is you know, we were, I, I loved going to the conventions because you got, I got to hand sell and I got to meet fans everywhere, all over the country. I got to go and visit the stores and, and strike up relationships with those owners that I'm, I'm still friends with them to this day. I still work with a bunch of them. Um, the other thing too, was I, I got to work on their POP program, which is point of purchase. So the point of purchase program is stuff like bookmarks, pens, but we came up with branded box cutters. We came up with standees. One of my personal favorites, and you might have remembered this, is we had engraved axes for the Wrath of the Eternal Warrior series. And like we did a on the DL, we were like, if you order 500 copies of issue one, we'll send you an axe. Um, and like, it was my job. I went and bought the axes. I found the engraver. I, I went and made sure they got made and then I shipped them out. Um, and I was hand, and I was selling them to stores. It was so cool. My other favorite was the time capsule for a series we did called 4001 AD. And I, my father at the time owned a, uh, a language center that did interpret uh, interpreters and translation. And so I got the issue of the comic translated into Japanese. We did a special cover. I got coins made meant to look like they'd be from the year 4001. I got lithographs made of some of the beautiful um, Clayton Crane artwork. Uh, we got special seals made for these containers. And then we shipped them to stores and we said, you can open them in four months when the book is finished. You have to, pr if you want one of these, you have to promise to display it and you can't <laughs> open it for four months. And we thought in four minutes, they're going to open this thing up, start putting stuff on eBay and it'll be great because everybody will know what's in it and everybody will want the stuff nobody opened these damn time capsules for four months. It was amazing. Never, It worked so great in our wildest dreams. We never thought it would work so well. And that was the sort of freedom. And, and you know, I remember Dinesh Shandasani in uh, my first interview with him said, you know, how do you feel about being a part of sales? Because it's, it's not really a creative position. And I said to Dinesh, I said, what are you talking about? sales is an incredible opportunity to be creative. And this were, these were some of the best examples of how to do that. So that was really, really cool at that time where it was just like, we were creating the systems from the ground up. So we didn't know what didn't work yet. So we could try anything. And that was really, really cool and, and very uh, motivating. So how did uh, you end up at IDW with crashing? Uh, that's Heather Antos. So Heather and I both left Valiant within a month of each other, if I remember correctly. Um, and Heather, uh, I had hired to be my uh, editor for the pitch before it had a home. And Heather, in the meantime, while we were working on the pitch, she got hired at IDW. And as the pitch was coming along, she was like, listen, this is really good. 
And IDW is focusing on what they call the IDW Originals line, which is more creator driven new IP. Do you mind if I pitch this? And I was like, uh, no, go for it. Both Morgan and I, Morgan was on the project by that point. We were like, absolutely. And Heather pitched it and they bit right away. Um, absolutely loved it. Mark Doyle, apparently over there, who's the executive editor, um, had been wanting to do a kind of like Gotham general storyline way back in the day at DC. So he was like, this was, this was the story he always wanted to tell that never got a pitch for. <laughs> so he was super stoked by the, the superhero medical drama aspect. And I mean, when I tell you it was the easiest, fastest acceptance I will probably ever get in comics, I cannot understate that enough. So right time, right place, right <laughs> people. That's it. That's all I can say. That's and how did you um? <laughs> did you how did, was it was it a similar story with the artist? Oh, I'm sorry. Wait, you were you were both you we were, were both, both talking. talking. Chad, go ahead. Go ahead. The artist from Morgan. I was just saying. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So um. So uh, was, I, was it a similar story? Or? Uh, pretty pretty close. I I reached out to a bunch of friends. Um, I reached out to Vita. I reached out to Danny. Um and a couple other people. And I said, Hey, I'm working on this pitch. Here's, here's the idea. Do you have any artists that you can recommend? Uh, one of the people I reached out to is the Manic Pixie Dream Boy. That is Ryan Katie. And Ryan was sweet enough to recommend Morgan because they did an awesome webtoons comic together called Wolfsbane, which if you love horror, I recommend anybody watching or listening to go read Wolfsbane on webtoons right now. Uh, well, not right now, listen to the rest of the podcast and then, then go. But um, so Ryan recommended me to Morgan. So I reached out to Morgan and Morgan uh, was uh, the, the second artist to say to, to be interested. Um, I had a great time talking with her and uh, Heather was already on board at that point. So I was able to pitch to Morgan like, hey, I've got Heather Antos working on this project, which I, I appreciate Heather letting me do. And. Morgan immediately understood, you know, because she said, I'm not a superhero artist. And I said, we're not looking for a superhero book. We're looking for a book about addiction. I want character. I want acting. That's what this book is going to require. And Morgan was great. Morgan was was perfect. She got on board and, you know, we, we got into an easy rhythm right away. Um, and she was an absolute dream to work with. Whole team was. It's it's the best experience. Like I, I I had the perfect experience right off the bat. Everything's downhill from here. <laughs> I was gonna say because you also had Triona Farrell on the best. Colors, who wow, Chef's Kiss uh, did a Tree, wonderful Tree, job. Tree Farrell on colors and Hassan Atmani El Hal on uh, letters. Yeah, like, I, it's it's you it's the best of the best of the industry. It really Your is. Hose. <laughs> it, it really is all downhill from here. <laughs> Yeah, it is. I'm that's, sorry. that's it. I, I had such a. I'm. I'm. I'm having. I'm having trouble now getting the next pitches ready because I'm like, whatever the next experience is going to be, it's not going to be what this yeah. was. And this was magic. This was pure it. magic. So. <laughs> it's a good thing you know basically everyone in the industry at least through a six degrees of separation thing. So through six um, degrees of separation, yes, absolutely, I do. <laughs> I mean, what else could you say? Um, kind of coming around to to more to, back to the. the plot elements and the, the sure. character beats in crashing. Like, like I said, there's a whole, whole lot about addiction and you've stated yeah. that uh, you, your mother is a substance abuse counselor. And, mm -hmm. um, but I have to say there is a lot here that I feel can't be gained from anything other than personal experience. And if you're if if you're comfortable with me asking, um, are sure. is addiction a part of your story? No, not okay. not in that sense. Um, okay, I I have an addictive personality that I know. Um, I I have stayed away from drugs and I've been very careful about alcohol because I understand that I can go down that road, and so I do my darndest to be very aware of it and not go down that road. Um, so for me, Rose's, Rose's struggle with addiction is not mine. Uh, I, I can't claim it. I won't claim it, but I, I've met people. Um, and I'll tell you what the, the most, somebody in another interview, Chad, uh, asked me at New York comic-con, what is success for this book? 
And I told them it's not sales. I told them I was already successful. And he said, what do you mean? Only one issue's come out. I said, because I had somebody at a signing who told me they were in recovery and thanked me for writing Rose the way that we did and showing addiction the way that we did. They felt seen in a way that they hadn't before in comics. And I said, that's success. That's it. If I get that, the book is, I don't care if it sells one copy to that one person. It's a success. Um, and I heard that everywhere we signed. And I did a signing tour. I think I hit like five or six states, um, 12 shops around there uh, for a couple months. And everywhere I would go, I would have people in recovery or going through it um, thank me and, and the team and, and say, y'all really represented something and, and made us feel like this is being treated seriously in a way that we haven't seen before. And that was so cool. That was that was so incredibly cool and rewarding. And that's not me. That's the accomplishment of the whole team in doing justice to Rose's journey and, and to her story. And and I really feel like you did because thank you. Yeah. Again, you you said that uh, you said that we were okay with spoilers. Um, Absolutely. Rose does not get let off the hook for past nope. behavior. In no. This. Um, it was very important to us that she did not. Yes. Yeah. And um, go ahead. Consequences. Go ahead. Consequences are a big part of recovery. Um, it's, a, it's a big aspect of making amends, but also accepting responsibility for what you've done to cause harm to others. And that is a re and, and there aren't happy endings um, in that sense. And addiction, addiction is not something that gets tied up with a bow that you feel like, okay, one day I'm an addict. One day I'm not an addict. That's not how it works. You know, um, recovery is a lifetime of work. Um, and I had a great conversation with, with some folks on uh, another podcast, one of which is um, an alcoholic. And he's been, he's been sober for many, many years. But he said, I still, every now and then, you still feel it. You know, you, you get into a trigger and something happens and you, rem you, you get reminded of what it was like. And it's, it's that, that's the thing we always wanted to say about Rose in this is that her addiction will never go away. Her actions have consequences that last forever. And she has to come to terms with that. And to do that, there's no, there's no, you know, neat ending for it. Um, there, there has to be consequences that live beyond the story that you see on the page. And that was also really important for me, though, because you want to imagine what these characters do next. I think that's a really great hallmark of of storytelling is if you want more, you want to imagine what happens next to these characters. Um, and if we could do that with Rose, one of the, the ways we do that is to show that her story is going to continue and that her actions will continue to reverberate beyond what we read and what we see. And well, so that was another set reason up why the sequel, yeah. even if it never happens, even if other stories within <laughs> this world take us to other characters uh you you did leave leave us a little nugget there on the last couple pages well, um, you, you want to give hope i want there to be some well, yeah like, yeah you know i, <laughs> we I don't, don't want, want to, we don't want to feel traumatized at the end of this we do want to feel hope so, no i don't like, this... i appreciate i appreciate yeah. that you did that because it, it, one thing it also makes clear and again this this kind of circles back to what you were saying about um uh, medical professionals just being absolutely fried and burnt out throughout the pandemic sure. is that's right there front and center on the yeah. page. It's not just yeah. Rose's addictions that are eating at her. It's her everyday life, 12, 16 hour shifts with people's lives literally in her hands. That will fry anybody. I don't care who you are. That kind of pressure uh, is, yeah. is unreal. I mean, you know, and pr look, pressure makes diamonds, sure. But it, at the other hand, pressure also will burn you out. And burnout is a really real thing oh, that they yeah, deal with. Totally. And, I, and I think also burnout is something that the whole world has felt for two years coming, you know, trying to crawl out of the pandemic. And now with the mm -hmm. economic fears and the war in Ukraine and everything like People are burned out and everybody understands that. And this is so much of this story is a story about the need for self-care 
And, and that was a really big message I wanted to get across. And if you look at the climax, the very, the climactic moment in this story is Rose deciding to make a decision that is the best for her, not necessarily the best for her patient. Um, and there is a difference. And, and I'm a big believer that there is such a thing as healthy selfishness. We all need to have a little bit of selfishness to preserve our sanity and our own health. Um, and our own well-being, and only then are we at our best to help others as well. If we are taking care of ourselves, we can take care of other people to the best of our ability. Oh, and you're that's 100% the thing. on point. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I do social work in my day job, and like that front and center, day one from the start, self-care, 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 figure out your boundaries between work yeah. and home, whatever yeah. that looks like. Maintain yep. that work-life balance. Do not let the two things bleed together because once you do, you start um, you start carrying that secondhand trauma. You mm -hmm. start uh, your your personal life and your work life just bleed together. You're mm -hmm. like you said, you're not at your best to help people, and you're not making sound judgments for them. So, and, and that's Rose. That, like you, you know? said, it's 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 healthy selfishness. Mm -hmm. And, and that's where I wanted Rose to be at the start. You know, at the start, she does not have those boundaries. She does not. She is, she's absolutely an addict, even though she's not using pills. She's just addicted to saving everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, and she is addicted to the feeling of saving everybody else. And one of the things I, I've learned about addiction is that past the once you're actually an addict, it's not about feeling high. You get high to feel normal, normal, to function like a regular person, but you need to be high in order to function like a normal person. You need that alcohol. You need those pills. You need that hit of whatever it is. It's not about I'm above the world and I'm all this. It's not about feeling superior. It's about feeling normal. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't feel normal when you're not high. You feel less than. You feel depressed. Your body is screaming for drugs and in pain. And so that's that's a really big thing. And that's burned out. That's you out of control, spiraling um, without borders, without the ability to to have moderation in your life. And that is Rose's Rose is full blown in addiction at the beginning of the series, even though she's been seven years sober. She just doesn't realize it. Right. She's so far gone and she's so burned out. And that was a really important place we needed to get her as the starting point. Yeah. If that's your baseline, if that's your normal operating, then one, it won't take much to get you beyond that because you're at mm -hmm. the edge and you don't realize it. So yep. very well done. It's a very oh. honest portrayal of addiction. We we wanted to do and it justice. I, yeah. Oh, well, I feel like you did. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's the whole yeah. team. The whole team really did it. So Now, am I remembering correctly that part of the profits were, you know, donated to like first responders or so so that was really cool um the uh there was a store in greenville south carolina called borderlands comics and games which is they just moved in in november to us i think it's sixteen thousand square feet it's it's one of those beautiful stores you're ever going to see um they did an exclusive cover by veronica fish and the entire proceeds for that cover uh, which had about 1200 copies i think all the proceeds went to a first responders charity called Tunnels to Towers. Um, and that was amazing. And when when Rob Young, the owner, told me he was going to do that, Rob and I have known each other again through the Valiant days, known each other for a decade now. And I, I love Rob dearly as a friend. And um, as soon as Rob said that, I said, well, I'm coming down for, for day one for a signing. So I flew from New York, from Manhattan, and I made sure like my signing tour started on release day at Borderlands Comics and Games to sign that special cover. He's still got a few copies. Like if you still want to support, all the proceeds still go there to this day. Um, it hasn't stopped. Um, I know he spotlighted it at South Carolina Comic-Con Junior um, last, I think it was October 9th. Um, he runs South Carolina Comic-Con on top of the shop. He does an amazing job. So that was that was what it was. It was, um, it was the shop ran um, an exclusive cover where all proceeds went to tunnels to towers so highly recommend anybody's listening check it out it's a great cause that is that that's just excellent i i appreciate that you bring that sort of uh civic mindedness 
to the project in in and uh just getting out there and helping folks like you're not just yeah, giving really. people axes uh <laughs> so <laughs> i still have one i still have one I, of those axes i, I know, have to keep i'm one. gonna have to get on ebay now and and see if i can track one down i bet they're i think it was going for like 600 bucks i think i saw oh, somebody's okay. I don't have for for now. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. listen matt just just give me a call make me an offer we'll see what we can do um <laughs> okay i mean I'll, I'll dm you on twitter uh, <laughs> so um what's your next project because you get you're super busy with your day job boy um, am i the, the day I, job. I, yeah. I've seen, I've, I've seen some photos of where you don't look super busy. <laughs> I, I know what you're referring to, and I wish I could take credit for any of that. Um, but, uh, you know, the day job is great. I, I mean, being at Penguin Random House, I, I'm, I'll go on record, and this is not a knock on anywhere I've ever worked. It's just it's the best job I've ever had. I've, I've never – um, working for a giant corporation is amazing. They are, my, my team is incredible. They, they teach me something new every single day. I have an incredible, uh, supervisor in Tyne Hunter, who's been such a, such an incredible advocate for the direct markets. Um, we have such amazing things planned and, and it, we our, our entire goal is just make the comics market healthier and bigger and better. And we're in it for the long haul. And it's it's so exciting because we're just scratching the surface, you know, to I'm I'm a big builder, you know. I started my first theater company when I was 21. Um, I came to Valiant when they were they were, you know, building their team out past their initial core. Like I love building, I love being at the beginning of something. And this has been such an incredible honor, and it's just such a pleasure every day um, to, to be a part of this. Um, as I said, I'm working on the, the web comic that'll be out in um, April. It's called The Rhyme Scheme. The, my main character's name is Mason Rhyme. So I have to figure out a rhyme pun for every uh, issue that for every case that we do. Uh, we're going to try and do have one a year. The rhyme of the Ancient Mariner yet. Oh, wow. I haven't done that yet. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, you're going to get a special thanks in, in next year's case when I come up with Listen, it. I'm all right with that. Um, you can also thank um, Iron Maiden because pitches. I stole it from I, their song but <laughs> rather than the literary source. But hey, uh, whatever. Who, who's taking? Who's keeping score? <laughs> so so that's, the, that's the very next thing you're going to see from me. Um, the trade for Crashing comes out July 4th. I'm going to probably be instigating another signing tour for that. Um, and then uh, I promised Heather that she would get my next pitches. So we're going back and forth on a couple really, really cool ideas um, that I probably shouldn't talk about quite yet. And uh, stay tuned. Uh, any day now, there could be some incredibly exciting news for Crashing Beyond Comics. So you never know. Okay. So keep your fingers crossed. It. Keep your fingers crossed. Something might happen. Um, okay. So a lot of really um, cool you heard things. it hinted here first. <laughs> heard what? So heard what? <laughs> Um, something, you no, know, it's, it's just cr crashing into you, the Dave Matthews band album. Um, <laughs> that's what we heard. There you <laughs> go. Um, how is when you, when you do a signing tour, how do yeah. you figure out which stores you're going to go to exactly? Like how in the world does that work? So, um, so I, it, one, it depends on your budget, you know, how far can you travel, you know, and, and how far can you travel on your own? Um, for crashing again, be, because Rob was doing the the stuff at Borderlands, the the charity uh, aspect to it, I knew that I would start in Greenville, South Carolina. So for me, and and I've designed signing tours for creators for at Valiant, and I used to I used to manage a little bit of that stuff. So what I would do is I I said okay on Wednesday, September twenty first, I'm going to be in Greenville, South Carolina, no matter what. So then I start plotting my map from there. The other signing that I had definitely on the agenda was Bedrock City Comics, which was in Houston. And they were very kind enough. They brought me and Morgan down to sign for Saturday. So I said to myself, OK, between Wednesday and Friday, I'm going to be in the Carolinas because I'm starting in Greenville and I have to end up in Houston. And I having worked in the industry and had a lot of relationships 
I know that the Carolinas are phenomenal sales territories. So I wanted to make sure that I could do, you know, I could drive 90 minutes from Greenville and I'm in Charlotte. So I would go to Rebel Base and then 90 minutes from Charlotte is Sailfish Comics in Winston-Salem. And then 90 minutes from Winston-Salem is Raleigh-Durham and that's Ultimate Comics. And so literally I did um, on Thursday, I did <laughs> the 22nd. I did Rebel Base at 1 p.m. I did Sailfish at from 3 to 5, 3 to 6. And then at 9 o'clock, I was at Ultimate doing their, their live stream um, and signing books that they would have in the store. So I did, I, I, I put a, in for, for three, four and a half hours worth of driving that day, I hit the big, some of the big major points in North Carolina. And then I knew I could fly out of Raleigh, Durham and go to Houston. Um, for Bedrock. And then I flew back from Houston. And I, uh, the next morning I got in at about midnight. The next morning I was in a car driving four hours to Annapolis, Maryland to Third Eye Comics. And on the way back from Third Eye Comics, I hit up Cards, Comics, and Collectibles, which is owned by a wonderful man named Mark Nathan, who runs Baltimore Comic Con. And I've been friends with Mark for years. So that was week one. Actually, that wasn't week one, because then I also had a signing at Bulletproof Comics um, at the end of week one. And so so for me, I knew where I was starting and I had some major points that I wanted to hit. I wanted to go, you know, being in New York, I have a lot of shops, so it's important to hit those local markets as well. Um, but that's really what I looked at. I knew where my starting point was going to be, and I just built my tour around that starting point and and trying it's all time management and doing a lot of google maps to figure out how far it is to drive <laughs> from one location to another that's it that's all it takes that's still so how is that i you know a rock band goes on tour they've got a whole apparatus to uh to to schedule this thing out you write comics that's a different scale <laughs> so i just i've always been curious how these things work well, um, my marketing my marketing background and, and having produced the theater actually helped tremendously because I, I understand I, I understand how to make a budget work for travel. Um, and also just in having done marketing and, and put together tours, I, I understand the major shops and the major markets. So I know where to get the most bang for your buck um, and who to reach out to. And, and that's just understanding your marketplace as much as anything else and doing the research. Oh. Sure. And all he needs is 90 here, minutes. Here, Oklahoma City, uh, we've got a couple really <laughs> solid shops here. Just going to throw it what, out you've there. Got, uh, is, is Impulse Creations near you? I'm trying to remember. No. No, that's Tulsa. Um, that's Tulsa. Yeah, they're Impulse in Tulsa. In Tulsa. Yeah, yeah, we've got um, All Star Comics and New World Comics. Shout out local guys. <laughs> right. um, yeah, both of which, uh, uh, cute. Uh, in the case of New World, they've been around for like four decades. So, sure. um, yeah, yeah, big, uh, big, uh, big built-in audience right there. So anyway, anyway, but um, well, you know, the the the, bo the book's coming out in July. I'm gonna be yeah. setting up the, the next leg of the tour. <laughs> um, you know, maybe maybe I'll make hey, my look, way down. I'll go out soon. there, dude. Um, you know, shoot me a DM when you've got a time frame. I can probably uh, I can probably talk to somebody and get get something set up for you. All right. Well, you know, we, we could probably do that. You know, Penguin Random yeah. House is a really good uh, policy for event orders um, <laughs> that, that make it there very attractive to stores to have creators out there. So maybe very we cool. Out. Very cool. It doesn't hurt to be working for, for the big guy <laughs> uh, at times like this. So you, there's in the last two, three years, there's been a ton of shakeup in the world of comic book, comic book distribution. How has yeah. that affected you at Penguin Random House? Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's exciting. Um, but I mean, you, you gotta, I, I'm a big believer competition breads quality. Um, there, there's a reason we encourage competition. Competition makes everybody better in, in theory um, when it's fair. And, you know, we, we just see, I, for me, I just see opportunity. Um, I just see so much opportunity in this because we as an industry, not we as Penguin Random Mouse, we as the direct market have been so 
static in our practices. Um, we, we understand that we do this type of ordering and we go to this type of customer and we order this kind of book and we display this way and this, that, and we've been so, we, we've been so limiting ourselves to what we can sell and how we can sell it as an industry. And I think in the last few years, as part of the shakeup, one of the cool things is that you get to reevaluate the reason, the way, and the how you do everything. Um, so why do I put a display this way? Why do I only order this type of product? Why am I limiting myself to this type of customer? You know, because it's the way it always was. But now with DC moving to Lunar and Marvel at Penguin Random House and Diamond, you know, figuring out its voice in the industry, there is opportunity here. Um, there is opportunity to carry more product than you thought. There, there is, and is one of my biggest pet peeves, there is no good reason the comics market is not the number one seller of manga on the planet. And we gave away that territory to bookstores uh, two decades ago. Um, not two decades ago, but, but about 12, 13 years ago. We gave it away and we never fought for it back. And now you see comic shops really getting into manga over the last few years and seeing the big surge and starting to take back that territory. Um, same with like pop culture cookbooks. There's no reason you can't sell uh, a Critical Role cookbook or a Stranger Things cookbook or a Spider-Man cookbook in your shop. There is a there is a customer for that who will come in. There's no reason we can't sell Star Wars novels at a comic book shop. That is not ground you need to give to Barnes and Noble. None of that, and that is something that we had built into our bones that we didn't sell those things, and now we do. Um, there's no reason we can't sell kids books. There's no reason we can't target um, women. There's no re we, reason we can't target the next generation of readers starting at six years old, there is more content and product coming out for that age group than there has been in decades aimed for comic book fans and the parents who are comic book fans. And we as an industry got complacent and stopped trying to expand and grow ourselves in that way. And now we're, we were behind the eight ball and we had given up so much mileage to these other sales channels sales channels. And I think one of the cool things you've seen in the last three years as this shakeup has happened is that comic shops have woken up and they're selling via live stream on Facebook live shows every week now and on Instagram claim sales and back issues have exploded in, in even more than before. But you're seeing them little golden book racks in shops all over the countries, which was not something they were thinking about 10 years ago. Um, we sell every every day I talk to shops and they're all like, we need to sell more manga. We're starting to sell more on Saturday than on Wednesday. And that's families coming in. So what are they buying? What can you sell me that they're going to buy? And they want to get educated on these products categories that they didn't think they were ever able to sell before, either because they were worried that Barnes & Noble would have that customer, which they don't, or Amazon, which they don't, um, or, um, or they just didn't feel like they could educate themselves on something unfamiliar. So now they're hiring these people who've been in business 40 years and, are, and really know single issue comics are hiring young people who know manga, who know kids books. Um, they're getting the experts on staff. They're putting that investment into these categories, which is so exciting. And this is where the opportunities are. And it's so cool getting to work with stores and in this marketplace at a time where it's about reinvention and it's about moving forward and it's about building back up. And, and I mean, 2021 was some of the best years ever for comic book shops. It was incredible. I had so many stores tell me 2021 was the best year ever. I had stores telling me 2022, despite the, the recession fears, was their best year ever. So, you know, and, and those who evolve are succeeding. Those who are diversifying their product line and carrying D&D &D games and magic and, you know, and Warhammer 
Um, they're, they're growing stores that are working with their local libraries, that are working with schools, that go in and speak to classrooms about comics and running comic book stores and offering student discounts and bringing people in and partnering with library mm -hmm. cons. Those are stores that are growing and thriving, not just surviving. And we've always had, a, we've had such a mentality of surviving. And that is not how you grow your business. That is how you slowly go out of business. And yep. that is the big difference I've seen in the marketplace these three years. Sorry. That I, was I go passionate, off. and I can absolutely tell you're in sales. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't have any questions because I don't want to follow that. Yeah, there's no following that. <laughs> so I, I hear exactly what you're saying. One of the things that I, I've seen just talking about comics is the diversification of type of content. Mm -hmm. That has, has come out in the traditional comics format. Um, we're slowly, not fast enough, seeing a diversification of voices. Danny Lore, they've had a brilliant resurgence in their it surge in their career in the last few years. Yep. I mean, so many so talented proud creators. We're, 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 yeah, absolutely. Where dog at Where Dogs on Twitter. Um, and it's even just one of my favorite like, Twitter uh, handles. It's one we, of we my favorite ever. We, we didn't even talk though. Like it's, it, the, the influence of webtoons has been incredible um, yes. because now you, Rachel, Rachel Smythe's um, War Olympus is one of the best selling graphic novels out there. And that's because mm -hmm. it was a webtoon comic first and then they got picked up and they're selling. And you're seeing that with manga publishers out the wazoo. Manga publishers understood that before uh, traditional comics publishers that you could take a web comic that has a web audience and they will come by the hard copy. You just got to figure out which ones and to get the creators to promote it, but they'll right. buy and they sell a ton of manga that way. And now more traditional book publishers and graphic novel publishers have finally gotten that through their heads and are picking up webtoons and top a series and Kickstarter books. You can build your entire career and audience on Kickstarter and then translate that to physical sales in your store. And that's another thing that I'm seeing comic shops learn is that they don't have to be scared of web comics. You're not promoting that they read elsewhere. You're promoting that they buy another format that they've already read elsewhere mm -hmm. in your store. And they're actually bringing that web audience to you. Web comics have done nothing but support growth in brick and mortar stores. They've not taken Absolutely. away the way everybody thought it would. And that's a huge yeah. change too, right? So it's Well, Mark Wade was right all along. Um, he, you remember, oh God, now it's been more like four, 14 or 15 years ago when web comics were just starting and Mark mm -hmm. Wade, very vocal supportive. And everyone was like, man, screw Mark Wade. He's a sub. Nope, Mark Wade was right. Go figure. And it, was, it, it <laughs> I brings remember, more people to the table. I remember I was working at Forbidden Planet when the new 52 hit. Um, mm -hmm. It was so cool. Actually, the day the day that Flashpoint 5 came out and Justice League 1 came out, we had a surprise signing with Jim Lee, Dan Didio, and Jeff Johns at the store. And I literally oh, wow. turned around because he was somebody was talking about um, – uh, what was the orange lantern's name? Like Globulus or something. Um, Larflees. Thank you. No, not Larflees. It was <laughs> it was a dude who looked like Slimer. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it wasn't an orange lantern. You're right, because Larflees was the only orange lantern. No, no, he was an orange lantern. He was. It was his like embodiment like, of yeah. His. Oh, I can't that's remember the name. right. That's right. His <laughs> little. I know exactly but, what you're talking about. But I remember somebody somebody behind me was making mention of that character, and I started to turn around and go and say, yeah, he was based on Slimer, and I turn and it's Jeff Johns. And I'm like, you probably know that already, sir. Um, <laughs> and just like, um, and I actually have a Jim Lee Batman Hush Noir, the black and white edition, and Jim was doing sketches in Sharpies real quick, and I have a Catwoman sketch by Jim Lee in, in my copy from that day. But one of the big things about the new 52 is it was the first time DC was going to go same day and date digitally. 
for all their books. Yep. So you could buy Justice League number one online the same day it was out in, in comic shops. And it used to be, I think, a month between. And everybody said, this is it. This is the death this of comic book yeah. stores. This is going to be the one that does it. What DC does, because DC does everything first. Um, and then Marvel perfects it. And that's sort of the way the <laughs> industry goes for the last 20 years. Marvel knows. David Gabriel knows. But um, and, and I love David. But so so DC is always first through the wall um, and they always get bloody. And they were the first one to really do it. And everybody thought, oh, this is the end. And we found out the exact opposite. Everybody read it online. Sure. And then they came in and bought a physical copy like it just supported right. those sales. And that was supposed to be the day the comics died. Never happened. Never, no. happened. never going to happen. If I have anything. And, to say. I mean, people uh, and the opposite was true as well, because people that would not have been inclined to set foot in a comic book store, perfectly willing to sit down and read it on their tablet. Yes. Um, and working I mean, at a destination yeah. shop, <laughs> working at a destination shop, like at Forbidden Planet, it was so cool because you would, I would get tourists. And they'd be like, well, I, I bought, I, I read this copy of Batman Long Halloween online and I really liked it. Now you're the first comic shop I've ever come into because I want to, I want to see what it's like and I want to buy a copy. And your job when you have that customer is don't hand them one book, hand them five, they'll buy three and they'll write down the other two and come back. And so I would be like, oh, Batman Long Halloween. It's great. You should read Batman Year One because that's sort of the, the prequel to this. And then they did a sequel called Batman Dark Victory. Um, and if you like this, the, this guy, you know, uh, Jeff Loeb also wrote this comic and this comic. And again, I would literally, my sales strategy was you came in for one book. I hand you five. You physically are going to hold the books because then it's a weird thing. But as soon as you take physical possession, it's hard to give it back. There's something in your brain you don't want to give it back. And they would leave with two or three books and write down the other two. And then they would come back next week and I would make a new customer. And it was just, <laughs> that was it. I'll never forget. There was a dude named Darius who came in for New 52. His girlfriend brought him into the store. I gave him Green Lantern Secret Origin by Jeff Johns. Um, he came back the next week. And when the New 52 hit, he got a pull box and ordered every single copy and was buying every single book for about a year. He was spending something like five or $6,000 a year. And a year prior, he hadn't been in a shop in 10 years. Um, but that's the magic. That's the magic of comics. That's the magic of the comic shop. And to bring Absolutely. it back to crashing, you were, you know, helping an addiction. There you go. <laughs> I, I, I'm addicted too. I have an addiction to selling. I have, addicted, I have an addiction to to making somebody happy because that's what we do in comics these are not this is not toiletries this is not underwear this is not something you need to get through your everyday life we're not selling right. food to put on the table we are selling escapism inspiration catharsis entertainment um we are selling a luxury item is what they classify us as but at the same time we are helping people be happy and find enrichment and find passion and find something that makes them feel included and seen. And that is magical. And that is also a privilege that I do not take lightly. And that's either at me selling to a person in a store, me helping a comic shop figure out how to, to reach new customers or to build their business, or me as a writer, um, hoping that I, I create something that resonates with a reader. That is all part of the same sort of cycle that I'm in and that's what I get addicted to. And I think with that, that, that might actually be the perfect place to uh, end the interview on that, that man, you just kind of like concluded your grand thesis there in a nice neat little bow, Matthew can congratulations, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much. Go ahead, Chad. Where can we follow you on social? Thank you. Yeah. Um, so you can follow me on Twitter at Matthew Klein 316 because I am the bottom line um, when it comes to <laughs> thank you, Chad. You get the, the Stone Cold Steve Austin reference. Um, <laughs> and then on uh, Instagram because I'm an idiot and I didn't make my uh, social handles all the same. <laughs> um, yeah. But I'm Mac the Knife 1116 on Instagram um, because 1116 is my birthday and Mac the Knife is my favorite song. Um, cause yes, I'm actually 72 years old in a 36 year old body. 
Um, and then uh, I'm on TikTok also at Matthew Klein 316. So you can find me on all three of those um, where I will post uh, videos and photos of that uh, not office life that Chad uh, made an allusion to earlier. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you uh, for taking time out of your really busy schedule for uh, talking about crashing and anytime. Uh, anything and everything that we touched on. Uh, your, the your state of the industry <laughs> for comics is very, very obvious. And I know you keep busy in your day job, but um, we, we, I speaking solely for myself, uh, I can't wait to see what you do next on the creative side. Thank so, you. Appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you for absolutely. having me. And I'll come back anytime. So, all right. Well, Matthew, uh, yeah, we'll talk again soon. Uh, until next time. Uh, we are the Comic Watchers, and this is our show. I'm Matt. This is Chad. Remember, the world can be a crappy place, but it doesn't have to be. You can get out there. You can be kind to one person at a time and make a real difference. So get out there. Be nice to somebody. Read something cool and support your local comic shop. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>